going to introduce myself and give you a little bit of background. Uh, my name is Elizabeth Kennedy, and I am the director of the solar programs at the Massachusetts Clean Energy Center. Um, some of you may have heard of us, um, but we are a quasi-public state agency that's um, sort of tasked with growing the clean tech industry here in Massachusetts. So, uh, myself and Lisa, my colleague, we focus on uh, solar programs and in particular ways to help enable homeowners and businesses actually put solar on their homes and take advantage of these technologies. So um, we've been running the Solarize Mass program for a couple of years now. Um, we've worked with a number of communities and the general idea behind the program is, is really a group purchasing model for solar. And so the idea is that we competitively select the communities that apply to participate and then in turn help the community representatives to competitively select a solar installer um, to participate in the program. So there's you know, a, a pretty rigorous uh, evaluation process to um, ensure that you're getting not only competitive pricing, because while they're, you know, pricing is a piece of it, it's also um, to ensure that you're getting an installer that will provide good customer service, quality installations, really understands the solar market in the state. Um, and the idea behind the group purchasing model is that um, as more people in the community um, contract for solar during sort of a, a limited time period, um, the price reduces for everyone. So there is actually incentive to get more people involved because there's a direct financial benefit to you. Um, so this is sort of an annoying slide. Can I move this over here to click? No. That's not going to work. Um, so one thing I like to do, and, and just sort of setting the stage, I, I'm sure a number of you know a little bit about solar um, already, but um, thinking about um, the amount of um, not only energy that we use, but the amount of finite resources that are available on our planet. And so this is a slide that um, a professor Dr. Richard Perez from University of Albany put together to help people sort of visualize what that means. And so if you click through, this is the amount, um, on the left hand side here, the little orange ball, is the amount of energy that we use on our planet every year. Um, 16 terawatts of energy per year. And then the, the circles on the right represent sort of uh, the finite resources that we have for coal, uranium, petroleum, uh, natural gas, and then we're going to get into some of the renewables now. So that's how much wind energy we could generate um, on an annual basis on our planet. Um, OTEC is Ocean uh, Thermal Energy Conversion, it's uh, sort of like tidal. Um, biomass, hydro, geothermal, and that's solar. So there's a lot of solar power out there that we can harness. Um, and the benefit of putting solar on your building is you're able to directly offset the energy that you otherwise would have been buying from the utility. We get the, we use this slide a lot because we get this question all the time, you know, particularly after a winter like this when I am just <laughs> I'm so done with the snow. But um, we get the question, is there enough sun in Massachusetts to actually make these projects economic viable? And the short answer is yes. I mean, we are never going to have as much sun as they have in the desert southwest. You know, you see sort of like the, the reddish yellowish um, uh, amount of sunlight that they're getting. But up in Massachusetts, um, you can see that we're sort of a, a solid middle green, which means that um, you know, we, we are getting a decent amount of sunlight, and we, we like making this comparison. Um, the little insert on the bottom right is actually the, the country of Germany, um, which has the um, most solar deployed in the country, and they have a worse solar resource than the state of Alaska. Um, and so, you know, they, they are building an industry around solar, and they have a significantly worse solar resource. Massachusetts. And I do also want to point out that at the Clean Energy Center, we have been collecting solar production data from the thousands of projects that are installed. Um, we've been collecting that data for 
over 10 years now, we have projects going back to 2002, and we have found that for systems that are well cited um, in the state, that they actually perform um, you know, very close to what they're estimated to perform at, and they perform very consistently. So um, you know, we have been able to sort of verify that those well cited systems do, do actually do what people say. Um, so, you know, we have the solar resource here in Massachusetts. The other thing that we have, which is not a positive, is high electricity prices. So we are at what we call the end of the pipeline. We don't produce a lot of energy here in Massachusetts, so we're having to transport it from, you know, the Midwest. Um, we are bringing hydro down from Canada, and the cost of transporting that energy is very expensive. And so. Um, this data is actually a, a year out of date. We, we need to update it, but um, for the 2012 data that was available last year, Massachusetts homeowners had the ninth highest electricity prices in the country. Um, and the, the little insert on the right was tracking Massachusetts residential electricity prices going back to 1990. And you could see, you know, there was um, a, a clear upward trend. It came down a little bit when the cost of natural gas um, came down, but I'm sure many of you are aware that um, the utilities actually raised um, electricity rates just recently um, in the order of magnitude of about 30%. No, you're um, kidding. <laughs> so, um, so, you know, our expectations are that electricity rates are going to continue to rise over the years. Um, it's, it's unclear exactly at what rate, but, um, you know, many people assume <coughs> sort of a, a, a typical rate of about 3% every year because that's what we've seen historically on average. So we have good sun and we have high electricity rates, which means when you install solar, um, if you're purchasing the system, you are essentially prepaying for your electricity for 20 to 30 years of your electricity up front <coughs> at a highly discounted rate than what you would be paying to the utility. So you then get savings beyond that. We also not only track production data, but we also track um, cost data and installation data for Massachusetts. So um, as of the end of last month, we had over 22,000 uh, solar projects installed in Massachusetts. Um, and you know, not all of them are residential, but quite honestly, the majority of them are residential projects. Um, and what this chart shows, the red line reflects um, residential solar costs over time since 2001. We talk about cost on a what, what's referred to as a dollar per watt basis, um, and you know you can think about maybe an, an average residential project being 5,000 watts or five kilowatts, um, and so you could see prices were were um, significantly higher and have come down dramatically um, over time, and as a result of that, the green bar represents the number of residential projects um, that have. Uh, been installed in Massachusetts under our rebate programs that we've had in the past. And so it makes sense that as prices came down, the number of projects uh, increased significantly. <coughs> and so I mentioned the, you know, 22,000 projects installed in Massachusetts. Um, this was a, this reflects what uh, Massachusetts looked like in 2006. All the little yellow dots represent solar installations in the state. And this is what the map looks like at the end of 2014. Wow. So we've seen, yes, yeah, so we're very excited. So, um, so we've really seen an explosion of uh, solar um, in the state and, and it's you know geographically dispersed throughout the state. Um, the benefit of these solarized programs is that we can really engage with the community and try and increase education and outreach because, um, you know, most people, because they don't live and breathe solar every day like we do, don't, you know, aren't aware that prices have come down so much um, over the last couple of years. And, you know, even if you looked into it a couple of years ago and it didn't make financial sense, it, it may actually now. <coughs> So thinking about the incentives that are available in Massachusetts, there, there are a couple to be aware of. Um, first of all, there is, there's both a federal and a state tax incentive that's available. 
Um, the federal tax incentive um, is up to 30% of the, the total cost of the system um, that you can get back as a, a tax credit from the federal government. There's also a $1,000 Massachusetts income tax credit um, that you can qualify for. Um, I know Conrad will talk about this a little bit later as well, but um, there is also uh, an incentive called SREX, which stands for Solar Renewable Energy Certificates. And what those mean is when you install a solar project, for every 1,000 kilowatt hours uh, that you produce, but just think about it as, as a, a portion of energy that you produce, um, the state will mint a certificate for you that you can sell on, on a Massachusetts market because there's regulations in place that require the utilities to buy these certificates. And the certificates essentially represent the, the greenness of the energy that you're producing. Um, so by generating and selling these SRECs, you can not only get the tax credits, but get an income stream on, on top of the electricity savings that you're experiencing. Um, typically, homeowners, it's not always the case, but I would say typically homeowners work with uh, what we call SREC aggregators or brokers, which are uh, companies that will help you to sell your SRECs. Um, and, and that way you're not having to sort of manage that on your own. There's also a benefit called net metering, which means that if you install a system and it starts generating electricity, if you're using electricity on, you know, in your home at that uh, point in time, the electricity that you're producing will go to meet you know, the demand that you have in your home. But let's say it's a really nice sunny day and you're not home, you're not really using any electricity, your system's still tr cranking out uh, electrons. And so, what ends up happening is that electricity goes through what's called a net meter, uh, which is the utility meter, and it, and it actually spins backwards. And the utility um, will keep track of that, and they will give you a credit on your um, next billing cycle of all of the excess electricity that you produced but did not actually use. So it's a way to almost use the um, utility, uh, the grid, as a bank that you can sort of store your excess electricity on this grid, get a credit for it um, on your electricity bill, even if you didn't use it at that given point in time. I'm not gonna talk too much about it, um, but I do just want to mention very briefly that um, Lisa and I at, at the state are working with the Mass Department of Energy Resources on a loan program for <coughs> homeowners that are interested in installing solar. Um, the reason I don't want to talk about it too, mon too much is that um, in, in all likelihood the program um, is not going to really be up and running until early summer. So it's, um, it's sort of questionable in terms of the timing, but I'd be happy to talk uh, in more detail about it. Um, I could also let you know we are very much plugged in with the communities and the installers, so as soon as there is more information uh, up and running about the program, we will be sure to let you know. Uh, but we're working with banks and credit unions around the state to try and get them signed up and interested in participating in this program. And then finally, the other thing, it, it's not really an incentive, but the other thing that I wanted to mention is you know, traditionally people think about um, installing solar and they think about, you know, purchasing the system, installing it on their roof and owning that system. Um, and, and that makes sense for a lot of people, but um, sometimes you don't necessarily have uh, the capital up front to make that investment or quite frankly don't want to make that investment. And so there is another ownership model which we call third party ownership. Um, which can be in the form of either a lease or a power purchase agreement, you might hear that term, which is basically when a third party actually owns the system, installs it on your roof, and then will sell you the electricity that it generates at a discounted rate relative to what you would pay to the utility. So you don't necessarily have to make a large upfront investment, but can still save a little bit on your electricity bills. Um, the, you won't save as much in the long term as you would if you, if you purchase the system outright, but sometimes that's a, you know, a preference to some people. So that's another option. 
I've already talked about goals of solarized mass and sort of the group purchasing <coughs> model, but um, you know, we do really through this program and through the, the great efforts of the volunteers yeah. want <laughs> want to um, you know try and um, sort of make the process simpler for people and, and really um, educate and do outreach in the community just to try and raise awareness. Um, so, and, and the, the way that the model works is that through the group purchasing model, the installers are able to save money on their uh, marketing and customer acquisition costs because of all the great work by the volunteers. And so they're able to then pass along those savings to residents in the community. Um, very quickly, this is sort of a cluttered slide, but just to sort of think about the roles of the different parties in the program. So um, the Mass Clean Energy Center and our partners on this program, the Department of Energy Resources, you know, we were involved in sort of getting a lot of the, the, the upfront work, getting the program up and running. Um, uh, Conrad will talk to you about um, the, the role of the installer, but they are sort of the technical expert. They will be the ones to go out and do um, free site assessments to help you determine even if solar would work for you. And then if, if it would, and you're interested in moving forward, they will help you with that process. Um, they are providing the, the tiered pricing, which means as more people contract, uh, the price reduces for everyone. Um, and they'll provide what's called a turnkey contract. So everything from you know initial feasibility and design of the system all the way through um, you know installation, making sure all the warranties are in place and things like that. Um, the the community, um, Austin and, and the volunteers, you know they're they're really focused on getting the word out, doing outreach. So I. I don't want to speak for them, but I would assume that they would appreciate any help that they could get if, if others were interested in, uh, in participating in that. Um, and then, so you, your, your job is really, if you're interested, just sign up. And I know there are a couple of new people that walked in, so um, there were little uh, sign up uh, squares if you are interested in signing up for a free site assessment. So under this round of Solarized Mass, we're working with five communities, um, Provincetown, Quincy, and then three communities out in Western Mass, uh, Plainfield, Ashfield, and Buckland. Uh, those three communities partner together. Um, this is the tiered pricing that I mentioned. So it's, it's based on total uh, solar capacity. The, the tiers are based on solar capacity, but we sort of equated them to like typical residential systems. So the first tier that you're in, it's the first, say, five homeowners that sign up, and then the sixth homeowner will put them into the next tier, um, and so on. Um, but the program is a limited time program, so it, it currently, it, it's only running through June 30th of 2015, and, and that's sort of part of the idea of the program is that you know, this is a competitive price that the installer is willing to offer. I talked a lot about the installer selection process, so I won't repeat that, um, but I, I can tell you a little bit about sort of historic um, results that we've seen in the program. So going into this round of the program, the typical um, price for a residential project was $4.92 per watt. Um, we can tell you, based on prior rounds of the program, that the average customer purchasing a system um, ends up saving anywhere from 18 to 20 percent off of the market price. So, so there are significant savings that can be that can be had. Um, and then, but both direct purchase and sort of a, a third-party ownership of a PPA or lease would be available. The other thing I do want to mention is just sort of the, the vetting process in, in selecting the installer. We do want to ensure that it is an experienced installer that you're working with, and we, we have minimum technical requirements that they need to meet. So it's ensuring that there are equipment warranties. Um, so all the panels need to have at minimum a 20-year production warranty. Um, the inverter needs to have a 10-year warranty, and the installer would provide you with a five-year workmanship warranty. 
So if there was anything that happened in that first five years, um, you know, you would be able to work with them on that. Um, there is no, um, there is no requirement that the system, you know, be a well-producing system. Um, but I can tell you, the, with these guys. Um, you know, they're working with you. If the system's not producing well, the numbers don't pencil out. So they are going to, to work with you to ensure that if you move forward, you're, you have a, a well-producing system. This also just re reiterates the exciting results that we see under the program. So these are the 46 prior communities that we have worked with uh, over the last couple of years. You don't have to you don't have to read it. It's just vi visually what this shows is that the, the red portion of the bars represent the number of small scale projects that existed in those communities before Solarize occurred. So this is going back in time for, you know, all time. <laughs> um, and then the blue portion of the bars represent the number of residential projects that contracted just under their six month Solarize campaign. So many communities more than double the amount of residential solar that they had just by participating in Solarize. And then this is the starting line. So for the five communities that we're working with this round, this is sort of where you stand right now in terms of the number of residential projects uh, currently, uh, currently in your town. And so I, I do have to put a plug in, you know, this, uh, this program is focused on solar um, and we are solar advocates, but um, it's always worth noting that generally the lowest hanging fruit in terms of energy savings and cost savings is, is looking at energy efficiency. So um, for anyone who has not done this already, you can go to MassSave.com and sign up for a free energy assessment. Um, the, someone will come out and provide recommendations on what you can do um, to, to save money on, uh, on efficiency. And even if you have done one, you can get a free one every year. So if you did one a couple of years ago, you, you're more than welcome to, to get another one. Yep. Is that the same as Cape, the, the Cape Light Compact? Is that the... Yeah. Yes. Is that yes. Cape Light the same? Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yep. <coughs> So with that, thank you very much. I know now you probably want to hear the, the meat of what the, in, the three installed <coughs> companies are, are offering, but I appreciate your time and thank you so much for coming out. Are you going to have questions later or now? Go ahead. I, well, while he's getting set up, I could do questions now. Yeah. Um, based upon the number of people homes in town that would sign up. Mm -hmm. uh, what do we have now and can we take a straw vote on how many, <laughs> are, how many, uh, how many would, would sign up today? You know, to do to, 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 to a solar. Do you want to just do a, just like a informal, like how many people do, we, do they think, how many people in here think they're interested? Yeah. Exactly. Sure, if you want. <laughs> I think it'll show us that. I mean, it, it might show you that you're already in tier two or tier three of the price. Exactly. Yeah. 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 Or you can talk about that, right? Or you have your yeah, we have yes. tier pricing. Yeah, yeah. sort of uh, roughly five cents per tier. Um, uh, or might that might be exactly what it is, no. five cents per tier. We need approximately four. Yeah. We need approximately 40 people to sign up to get the highest tier. It's not that many. And that's based on the average system. And how much is that blah, blah, per blah. kilowatt hour, hour, I mean, for the install? It's 370. Yeah, so, it's it's yeah. Yeah. so it's not. Did you go ahead and do this presentation? It's not a high bar. Question on the net metering. Um, can you can the owner um, share the net meeting between between multiple properties in the same same community? Yes. yes. So so the question was, could someone share your net metering credits uh, between different properties? So. Um, Yes, so that's called virtual net metering. There are some parameters around that, but a, a good example is let's say you're a municipality and you want to put 
um, solar on your landfill, for instance. Um, you can put a big project located on the landfill over here, but you say, I have you know, the town hall account and the library account and you know, all of these buildings that have electricity accounts. You can technically um, say, I want X percentage of the net metering credits to go to this account, X percentage to go to that account. Um, so th the same thing could happen on the residential scale, but you would just have to be within the same utility and the same load zone. And so what does it mean by, last time I looked at this, it was, which was probably 10 years ago, it was vaguely defined as neighborhood. And I don't know that, I think it was, it's, has there been clarification of that now. since? Yeah, yeah. And what is the region that you can share it within between multiple properties? It, um, it's the, so the same utility, and then it, there's, it's technically the same load zone, so the, the grid load zones, and there are three of them in Massachusetts, and they, they essentially break up the state into thirds. Um, so. Cape is all of one. So for us it would be Cape Cod. Yes. Yes, exactly. All of Cape is included. Yes. Or if you had, if you had a other resident in Boston. Mm -hmm. Right. There's not all the, it depends on if ever sources in that territory of Boston. There's a couple of towns off Cape that are yeah. included with the Cape, but not many. It depends on what town you're Oh, it comes about. down that low? Yeah, yeah. it's like southeast. Okay. Or, yeah. okay. So what, what tier is Province Town in right now? Zero. Zero. We're just starting. Zero. Okay. <laughs> yeah, baseline. <Zero. laughs> yeah. Anybody who's done it now has done it on their own. <laughs> Are you going to cover any information here, like about the historic district, or is there going to yep. be a question period? Or? So I might be able to speak with that, but we'll go over that okay. at the end. Okay. Okay. Um, thanks for coming out. You guys are, it's a, a pleasure to, to get to <coughs> talk to people about solar. I hope you guys enjoy enjoy this. Uh, it's, uh, there. Been, I've, my name is Conrad Geyser, Katuit Solar is my company. Uh, I started uh, around 1988 uh, doing solar work, uh, primarily servicing solar thermal systems. Um, so I've spent a lot of time on roofs and, and, and done a lot of this stuff. Um, and uh, the, these systems, these grid type you know, PD systems that we're talking about tonight have, have really been a great revolution in, in uh, solar industry. Those of us who you know still do some thermal work are going, you know, wow, these these grid type PV systems are a lot easier and, and a lot better, really. The, the solar thermal systems work great too, but they were um, maintenance intensive and uh, and just more problematic, more difficult to install, and you have to store your energy on site and use it on site. Whereas with your grid type PV, you get to use the grid as as a, as basically an exchange network for your for your power. Um, so it's really it's really been fantastic, and, and we're in the midst of um, hopefully changing the utility model from what has always been traditionally a generation top down sell you power. Um, model to a, a shared, you know, power model where we're all collectively, you know, putting electricity in and taking electricity back out of the grid, and, and that's a that's a bit of a problem for the utilities, um, and they're struggling. That that struggle is going on as we speak at a fairly <coughs> intense, you know, level across the country, and and this is this is just a small, you know, a small part of that. Um, we we still have a, a nice window here of about a year left in Massachusetts, probably for NSTAR territory, where we'll have uh, you know capacity under the current net metering cap to to do our work. Um, and most residential systems, hopefully, will stay eligible even beyond that cap. We'll, we'll see how that goes. But any, anyhow, this is this has been very exciting, very uh, very fast paced uh, last six years um, as as this pro as these things have. Move forward. That's sort of a duplicate of Elizabeth's slide earlier. That there's just a, an incredible resource there. Um, if we could manage to harness it and store it and use it, we'd have uh, um, way more energy. Sorry, there used to be a slide after that one. Uh, it's something like eight thousand times the amount of energy that we really need. Uh, of course, you know, harvesting and, and using all that is is the problem, and that's where. The three of us come in, and I believe I should spend a little more time speaking about the three of us. This is me, Do It Solar. Jason on, on the right in the blue shirt is E2. 
and Mike is Blue Selenium over there, and, and we've, we've partnered together to do this. This is our second time that all three of us have partnered together. Uh, we did Solarize Wellfleet, um, which we're just wrapping up, which was a phenomenal success. Um, those, that town's a tough town you know, to beat. I, I, you guys are up against a big challenge here, but I... We always oh, beat Wellfleet. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> you name it, we beat him. <laughs> that's what we want to do. This is all about competition. I like it. Yeah. 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 To bring it. Great. Awesome. That's what, that's what, that's what we're here for. Um, so we try to move through the, probably everybody here has already levelized cost of energy, you know, solar, is, the cost is coming down, your solar range is here, crystalline rooftop, um, your, your various other sources uh, below, below the line are fossil fuel sources uh, are here. So you can see that the further to the left you are, the closer, the cheaper you are, and, and solar is, is rapidly approaching what they call grid parity, where incentives won't be necessary to be competitive. And, and in some cases, Hawaii, for instance, it's, it's already there. Hawaii's the utility without prodding from the government or any um, incentive programs has already planned to go 100% solar by, I, I think it's 2040. They're, they're just the nature of Hawaii, you know, it's an island, it's hard to get fossil fuels and the sun, the solar resource is fantastic there. You know, it's, it's already there. They don't need um, any, any help. And, and we're rapidly getting there in Massachusetts. Um, fuel prices going up. Yes, we know this, um, except for when the OPEC nations decide they want to try to, you know, work on us a little bit and drive them down temporarily and make us all forget that actually we have an energy addiction problem, a fossil fuel energy addiction problem. <coughs> Um, incentives, this is an ancient slide, I'm sorry, you know, but I keep it in here. Uh, the, the, the psychological effect, you know, is of, of the fact that we're sort of living this life that is essentially destined to run into a brick wall, you know, completely dependent on fossil fuels for everything that we do, is, is a problem. That hurts, you know, that when you wake up every morning and you think of that, that's not great. So there is actually a, a psychological um, benefit to this, um, which doesn't get talked about a lot, so I keep it in there. Economic, these are deep energy retrofits is another thing that, you know, we're, we think about some where all our buildings are way, way too leaky if we're gonna continue to condition the space, um, but the economics aren't great, 12 to 20 year payback. We talk about paybacks a lot. I'm, I'm sorry, it's, it's, you know, some people don't wanna hear about paybacks. They think, you know, well, what about the payback to, for climate change and all that? That's, you either get that or you don't. I, I, I can't, you know, instill that in you tonight. So presumably you've already gotten that and that's why you're here. Um, so when I talk about paybacks, it's just really simple economic paybacks. How many, I put $40 down. If it's a four year payback, that means every year I get 10 years back. It's not, we're not talking about interest or, or, um, what's the favorite financial, you know, um, net present value. yeah, net present value, thank you, you know, stuff that gets into more down, down the rabbit hole economics. This is just really simple stuff that, that even I can understand. Solar domestic hot water, six to 12 year payback, even with current programs. Just a rougher go than your PV, which is what we're talking about, four to seven year paybacks, and you'll see that. <coughs> If we hit tier five, that you know, in your best case scenario, you're going to have a four-year four-year payback on your on your system. That one's pretty basic. Time, time. We got to get moving here. Ideal solar customer. You, if you have a tiny, tiny bill, you still can be an ideal solar customer. You just might have to do what's called Form Z your your excess power to another account, and and we won't. That's we'll just. Leave it at that. Won't go down there till you till you have to. Um, a decent amount of space. There is a um, a set cost to doing a grid type PV system. You have to, you know, get a interconnect permit from the utility. You have to, you know, do a construction. You have to wire the thing. You have to get an electrical permit and get it inspected and all those things. So if you only have enough room as the size of this table for a solar resource, it's not going to be worth it. You've got to have at, at least Let's just say that says 300 square feet, you know, maybe down to 200 square feet, but something of, of reasonable size to, to do anything. 
Southerly exposure, preferably. Flat's actually okay. There's a fair amount of flat roofs in P-Town, um, so that, that's, a, that's a good bet. Um, and shading is, is an issue too. You can't, not so many trees. So I don't think we're gonna run into a lot of shading, but, and, but uh, historic district we might run into some, we'll see. Um, this has to do with roof orientation and efficiency. You're um, 180 degrees is south. Uh, 40 degrees slope is, is where our latitude is more or less. So you get 100% of your system. But you can see you can go all the way out to uh, east, an east roof or a west roof. And on a low slope, on a 10 degree slope, you still get within, you know, above 80%, which is a routine cutoff. If you go below 80%, your economics start to go downhill. These days, the PV is getting so cheap. You have such a good deal. So maybe you could, you know, move out into the 70% range, and instead of a four-year payback, you're going to have a six-year payback. That's okay. You know that that's increasingly the case where ideal roofs and ideal sites aren't aren't as important as we used to think of them. Um, fun slide. Just your monthly average production on a whatever KW. I'm not sure what range we're at. Looking it looks like a five KW. You know, obviously January low, May is good, July is good. Why does June dip? Fog, I guess. I'm not sure. Uh, um, nice big system. That's a, that's about as far as you can go without having to do a expansion break, unless you have fancy equipment that the I don't know about. How big a system is that? that? Oh Lord, put me on the spot. I think that's about a 20, 18, 18 kW. So that's. Um, and when you say systems, you guys sound like you're already up to speed, but you're, you're always talking about DC nameplate when you're talking about PV um, system size. So DC nameplate's a great metric because it's, it's uniform. You're always comparing apples to apples whenever, you know, different modules, except for, uh, I'm not going to make the mistake that I made in Wellfleet and say, yeah, even SunPower, you know, a SunPower. A SunPower module uh, does uh, make a little bit more per DC nameplate uh, according to a third-party independent study than others. But, but basically, when somebody says to you, okay, this is a, a 5KW system, any other person can tell you, oh, well, ours is a 5KW too, and they're not lying. It's all, it's all the same. It, it's a DC nameplate, um, which is, is the rating on the module itself, and that's all third-party tested, and there's standard test conditions that it's done under. So, so you don't, nobody can, it's a standardized industry and a standardized number, and so, you, you know, nobody can fool you with, with goofy numbers like they can in the wind industry. Don't look out for that. Um, talk, to, talk to a solar installer before you buy a wind turbine. Uh, <laughs> I, I also deal a little bit with wind turbines. This is, this is your prices coming down in uh, cost of modules, uh, 70 plus dollars in 1977 to about 70 cents, um, and that's to two year old slide. It's still about 70 cents. That's if you get a good bargain and you're buying bulk modules. Um, so two orders of magnitude down, pretty crazy um, what we can do when we decide to make up our minds to do it. Um, Grid tide PV, all have that down, understand what we're doing. We're running into the grid and running near backwards. Standard modules, sun power modules are uh, um, something that, that Jason and Mike deal with. Uh, Katuit Solar doesn't. Uh, they're a higher output module, special, uh, slightly different uh, technology. They're still crystal and silicone, so they're, they're, they're basically the same, but they, do some, they have some tricks where they they squeeze uh, about a 20% efficiency out, a little bit more, 20.1 efficiency, as opposed to an 18% efficiency for standard standard modules. So if you have a, a site that is space constrained and you are really gung ho to get the most out of that space, you might want to look at a sun power module. It's, it's a significantly higher cost, but uh, also a you know a good out, output. One um, quick question. I don't yeah. know about the others in the room, but you're talking way over my head. I don't know what happened with yeah. you. I actually I forgot to include a slide in my presentation, which I, I normally do. Um, could you just explain like the panels and the inverter and like how that? Back up. Yeah. Back yeah. up a little bit. Thank you. Okay. You got one so, coming actually. There's a uh, the grid the grid the type the grid there type you go. Thing. Oh, Here we go. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Sorry. These aren't in perfect order. I apologize. We don't do these every every day. You know. Have the bugs worked out. You've got your modules. 
it, which is the name for a, a, a PV panel. That's the, that's the name that, that we're always gonna, you're always gonna hear is, is module. Panel tends to refer to a thermal panel, an old fashioned solar panel. Is this a standard? Sorry? Is this standard? Standard. Um, standard. Yeah, yeah. There's well, there's actually hundreds of manufacturers, but they do tend to be standard size, and a, and a, and a typical output is you know somewhere between 230 watts and, and 280 watts. Um, Sun Power's leading modules 327 now. Is that it? 345. They're always they, those uh, over the years have slowly risen um, incrementally. Makes DC power, um, and this is actually. This is a good representation of what happens, although it's the diagram slightly different these days because we're using microinverters more often than not. What's a microinverter? Right. A small um, one. Well, well let's, let's go through the macroinverter first, <laughs> the string inverter. So these are all wired together. They go into a, a thing called an inverter, which is just monitoring the electrical grid, which is AC electricity, um, and it's it's uh, checking the voltage and the frequency, and it, and. It is transforming this DC electricity to match the AC grid and and pushing it back out. It's basically um, increasing the, the voltage and maybe the frequency a little bit. So so it's actually pushing your NSTAR meter backwards. Actually, NSTAR meter. This is your production meter that reads all the power that you produce goes through your production meter. So you get a production meter and you know exactly what your system. This is a revenue grade meter and you know exactly what your system's producing. It goes into your, your main panel typically um, where it pushes the electricity back out when you're producing more than you're, than you're using. Um, if you're using more than you're producing, the electricity looks like this. If you're using less than you're producing, the electricity is actually flowing back out on the grid. The, the inverters are you know, an amazing piece of electronic equipment that is, is uh, uh, monitoring the grid and, and matching your DC output to the grid and pushing pushing that current back out. It's also shutting down if it sees anything wrong with the grid. Any anything that's five, the voltage or frequency is more than five percent out of parameter it shuts down within 20 milliseconds, and that's just a safety feature that prevents any problems from happening to any linemen or anybody working on the grid outside. What what happens in power arguments? Uh, a typical system does go offline. You can get what's called a you know a battery backup that keeps it online but the cost and we'll have a quick slide on that are, are prohibitive it's pr pretty expensive and most people don't very few people actually do opt opt for that um, there's one exception where SMA is the one it's one of the leading if not the leading worldwide inverter manufacturer has a, a plug that is called they, their acronym is SPS secure power supply that works a little bit while the sun's out with no batteries. Um, if the power's off, you have to switch something over. It's very simple. Um, but generally speaking, you don't have the use of your system when the power's out unless you buy additional equipment. Oh, microinverter. Microinverter. You want to go to do microinverters? Let's go straight to oh, it. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. yeah. There's a new code, uh, 2014 electrical code. We're uh, um, lucky here in Massachusetts to be the only state in the country that adopts the, the code the year that it's published. So we're the guinea pigs for what's called rapid shutdown. And um, it basically says this section of wiring between your DC modules and your inverter must be shut down to below some number of volts in 30 seconds. I think it's 12 or 15 volts. And that doesn't happen on your traditional systems. As long as the sun's shining on your panels, there's an electrical potential on all these lines going down your inverter. Um, let's not get into why they think that should happen, but uh, because I'll get sarcastic. Um, <laughs> but they do, and therefore we are primarily using microinverters these days. The only exception is if your inverter can be located within five feet of your array if it's inside or 10 feet of your array if it's outside. Um, and in that case, if you have, if you're one of those special people that have that situation, I would encourage you to, to think about string inverters. They're less expensive and they're central. Um, you can, you know, service them more easily. In your microinverter uh, situation, each one of these panels has a small inverter under it. And it has, and there's, a, there's also a thing called an optimizer, and to not confuse you to death, 
they both sort of do the same thing, in which case they shut down this section of wiring when the power's goofy. So the power goes out, this, these wires are dead too because there's units under each one of these modules that are shut down. One of the advantages of microinverters and uh, optimizers is that each panel is regulated individually too, and that's helpful. That's slightly better efficiency. And if you have partial shading on your roof where, uh, you know, say a tree branch or a light pole or something sends a shadow across the roof over the course of the day, you'll get a better, you'll get better performance. Move, move it along. So what you're telling me then, the panels have inverters built into them, and the wiring coming off that panel is not DC, it's AC. That's right. In the case of microinverters, that's right. In the case of DC optimizers, it is still DC, but it's controlled, a controlled DC. It can be shut off at the source. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank you for that. You're with me. Now you love that. <laughs> <laughs> I have two. I just don't want to say anything. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, okay, so since everybody got all that and they're really ready to go, we can just make this the last slide. Sign up. Call the number. Have a great night. Thanks. <laughs> just <laughs> uh, Are you done? Yeah. Are you done? Um, call us. Call the number, go onto the website. There's a million ways to find us. Um, Solarize P Town, probably just Google, you know, you know or, or use, you know, Bing or somebody, Solarize P Town, and uh, you can find us. We're easy to find. Here's your tiered pricing. We're, we're, I, I hope we hit this. I mean, we should be able to if, if we're worth our salt. Um, 370 a watt, comes down five cents each, each tier. Um, On that per watt, that's that's that per watt pricing, and that per watt's that same DC nameplate watt. So we're talking apples to apples. Um, things that might drive your prices up, we call them adders in in uh, solar speak. Um, adder and price adders. So adders is a bad word. You don't want to hear adders if you can avoid hearing them. Historic district, we're going to run into that. Um, double inspection, I don't think we're going to run into. I think the, the uh, wiring inspector, if he continues to be as, as workable as he has been in, in Provincetown, won't be an issue. Metal flashing, another, another ad, ad bid cost. End phase is the microinverter, and so most of our systems are probably going to have that. That's our, that's our go-to microinverter. Solar Edge is the DC to DC version of that. It's also a cost, same cost adder. Oh, no, sorry less cost adder for solar edge, same percentage expected. Excuse me, Tygo is also historic district 60%, does that mean it's an additional cost? No, no, that's we expect that about 60% of the systems will fall in the historic district. Oh, okay. That's, oh, that's, that's that's like, no, no, it's, it's 350. Well, we can leave it out. Get it We can, uh, in the history, Within the town, we can site solar panels in our yards as long as you're meeting the setbacks. If you have, have a yard. Of, if as of right siting or if you have a yard. Um, is it possible to start a system in your yard and then at some point <coughs> move it up to your roof? Yeah, I mean, anything's possible. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you know, like realistic. And, and I, you know, there's. I see people who are in the same position that I am, who are on Commercial Street, 80% of the town is in the historic district, and <coughs> I, can, so I can literally put the panels in my yard, but I can't put them on my roof. Well, not yet. That's another discussion. Well, uh, I mean, that's another discussion. You can, you can do that. You, you can do what you're saying, and certainly. I mean, but a serious part of your cost is actually okay. mounting and wiring. So, you know, taking your modules and moving them from your yard. I mean, if you've got a yard situation that continues to work, you might want to put additional modules on your roof later, or, or not, or move them. I mean, that's so certainly would, possible. If you, if, some, if you put them on your yard, is it going to be a lesser um, cost? No, actually, there's a, that's, an, that's an add or two. It's another one of those bad words. 40 cents for us. I think that's what the... Yeah, I think that's what's a lot. Forty cents a watt more, just because you're having to build structure when you're when you're doing a ground mount. That's what we call it, a ground mount. But that's normal, and you still should have normal economics that are reasonable. It'll just be a little bit, you know, more. Probably a five-year, five to six-year payback rather than a four or, 
or whatever, or probably closer to five. But yeah, yeah. Do do we do ground mounts all the time? Sometimes huge ones, and sometimes. Mm -hmm. I think uh, maybe I should go ahead and, because it's already been brought up a couple of times, um, speak to the story district question. It is the number one question that I get, inevitably, you know, oh, my house is in the story district, I heard that it's not going to be approved for solar panels. And so first off, a disclaimer, I cannot speak for the story district commission. I'm not on the commission, obviously, and I'm not their staff, but I have spoken with our permit coordinator and our town planner, both of whom are staff liaisons for the HDC. And um, I, as I understand, before um, our new town planner came on board, there were a lot of applications turned away. And so, um, but since she has been on board, everything that has come before them for solar panels has been approved. So I think that she has really done a good job with kind of turning that board around in terms of solar panels. Now, that's not to say, I don't want to make that a blanket statement and say, yes, everything is going to be approved by the HDC. Um, like I said, I can't speak in that regard, but I will be having, I will be attending their meeting um, and talking with them about the Solarize program um, and hopefully bringing them on board and helping them understand that, you know, this is a way for the town to move forward and this is not necessarily, um, a, you know, in opposition to historic preservation. So, so as, it, as it stands now, anybody in the historic? district has to go before the historic commission to get mm -hmm. approval yeah. or you can get a building permit you need to have approval from that but there is a state or state has somehow said they can't do this I mean they can't I they am not I'm not an expert on think zoning so. laws my understanding is that the state has said you cannot have an outright ban on solar yeah. panels right and there is no outright ban on solar panels in province town and mm -hmm. they are considered on a case-by-case -case basis by the historic district commission what the Historic District Commission is going to do is they are looking to balance <coughs> the renewable energy needs of the town with preserving the historic character that everyone loves. So um, if you do have questions, I'll be around afterwards, um, but probably what I'm going to end up doing is putting you in contact with our town planner who is really the better person to talk to about this. As installers, too, work on the cape. We go up and down Oak Highway Highway to Orleans to, to Chatham, or Ch Savage, excuse me. And, We've all dealt with historic boards up and down. We're familiar with being in front of them and, and working with them to get them to a place where they're comfortable with what you're installing. So that might be clean edges, straight lines, taking a panel out here, adding one there. You know, that Sometimes you just need to work with them a little bit, and, and they're great. And that may be what needs to happen here in some situations. The deadline, though, Compromise. It's by June 30th, is that correct? To get into this? The deadline to sign a contract is June 30th. Right, right. so, and if we have to go individually, like she's in the historic district, I'm in the historic district, if we go, you know, I, it, they don't have their meetings every week, right, mm -hmm. it's like once a month. Is there any way when you do talk to them that you could say, all the people who are interested come to this one particular thing, we all enter our, our applications at the same time kind of thing, so it's like a massive if I had to speak to them, they would not want to do that because they want to look at you all individually, case by case basis, and take time to review those things. I would say that they would do but that. They but they have I don't a lot of sure special enough. meetings yeah. just for that, so that I come in with my application to go on the tour you all. Well, we can right? watch it and fly. We have to turn the, the paperwork into the historic district a month before they meet. Right. Too, so. And then if 40 of us show up, they're going to have, you know, just a lot of. Yeah. A lot of stuff to meet a deadline. We've talked a little bit about that, I think, already in phone conversations. I understand, but, yeah. and I will have to speak more with Gloria about it. I think, honestly, um, I, I almost see an avalanche of these applications as almost a good thing because I think it's going to help the Historic District Commission. It's going to really show them that the interest is there and, and this is in the best interest of the town. Um, I can't speak to the application process. Like I said, I'm not, not an expert in that. I'm not sure what your um. Who, who do you represent? And what's uh, your company? Your uh, I'm with the town. Are I'm you the energy town? manager for the town. <laughs> 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 Are you the new town manager? No. Oh my God. <laughs> no. No, I'm the energy manager. My name's Austin. Austin. Oh, hi. Nice well, I'm not gonna ask this question. Then I'll wait. Address <laughs> For Austin, if you want, you a question for Austin. Look at Austin if you want him to answer it. Sure. Yeah. Um, are mm -hmm. there going to be definable guidelines issued by the Historic District Commission? So I hope this is the last HTC question I get because I really can't answer them. I'm right. sorry. The I 
I did speak with um, the permit coordinator this week, and I've spoken with them several times, and every time they assure me, you know, things have turned around. Um, but he, he gave me some parameters, but it's mainly, the main factor they look at is how much will this be detracting from the historical nature of the building? That's the problem. <laughs> Okay. But you know, if we had these rules in effect when we all started having air conditioners, there wouldn't be one in any window. They wouldn't have been allowed. Skylights or Skylights, satellites windows. or the list goes on. HBM. 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 Question? No. Good. All right. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So the three companies present. Tonight. Yes. Yep. Is it all, is it a conglomerate? Uh, no, we're independent or, companies. Huh? Independent companies, and if you particularly have a preference to one of the companies, you're welcome to request that. And how do we determine, like, if you're cheaper than him? The, the way uh, we do it is, 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 is completely random, which is, you know, one, two, three, one, two, three. It's just, um, you know, and if somebody seems like they're getting all the 1KWs, we'll sort of shuffle that around. The 1KW. So, yeah. We don't really want 1KW. It's too they, small. All the small ones. They agreed on pricing. So they all are all offering the price. same pricing. Oh, they are. That's yes. a set price. That's yeah. right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it's yeah, so it, yeah, yeah, yeah. it isn't like I have to pick one. Well, yeah. yeah. no. no. Right, 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 right. Cool. That's, thank you. Has there been an analysis done about your installation where we, the homeowner, pay for and own the system as opposed to some of the systems where the installation is done at no cost to the homeowner? Yeah, oh, tons of them. The, the upcoming slides. Thank you. Yes. Okay. Um, is anyone going to talk about um, upfront cost financing grants? Here we are. Yeah. We're yeah. in the perfect segue into this slide. <laughs> um, <laughs> This is a you know a five kW, which is a large large residential system, um, representing a price. So you'll have to work your way through. Here's our tier one, you know, worst case scenario pricing. Here's our tier five, best case scenario, three ninety five versus three seventy per watt. This is uh, also we got no adders in this one. There's that bad name adders, you know. So you'll you know this is a good good case scenario. Gross cost nineteen seven fifty eighteen five hundred. No sales tax on residential. Um, federal tax credit. So this is the case where you need to, I'll get my finger out of the way for that picture. Thank you. Um, you know, you need to be able to use that federal tax credit to take advantage of these. And that's the one case where your lease system or your per power purchase agreement system sort of gets you out of a jam. If, you, if you're not showing any federal income tax, the, the lease system takes care of that for you. Um, State tax credit, thousand dollars capped, um, fifteen percent or a thousand, whichever is lower. So here's your net cost on your two tiers. Let's just stick with tier five to keep it simple. So, so you've, you've gone from eighteen thousand to five to you know roughly twelve thousand um, dollars with your various tax credits, your two tax credits. Um, we know how much your system's going to put out. We we can we those numbers are solid. Sorry, go ahead. What if I love all this, but I don't have twelve thousand dollars? Then, then you should um, get. Probably, our recommendation would be wait for the ever-promised CEC loan, which Elizabeth promises <laughs> she'll get out by by uh, before she leaves this summer. <laughs> we can just I'm say Elizabeth very hard on it. can't go yeah. can't go away until that loan's out. It will, I mean, so so we are working on a loan program. So um, if if you are interested in waiting for the loan program, um, you're you're more than welcome to do that. Um, there are other ways to finance projects. Um, if you have equity in your home, some people use um, uh, like a home equity loan um, or or other or other loans. Um, the, the reason that we are working on a loan program is because that's not applicable to everyone. So we're trying to, you know, we're trying to explain to banks and credit unions that, you know, you, you provide a loan for someone to go on vacation or to buy a boat, but you feel like <coughs> solar is risky. And we're trying to um, demonstrate to them that these are actually very good investments because the homeowner will be saving money and more likely to repay their loan. So, so that's something that we are, uh, we are working on, but there are other loan options out there. <coughs> solar specific about, loan options. Yeah, right? solar specific. Yeah, solar yeah. specific. When you talk about payback, what does it mean in actual dollars? If I've just spent $12,000 for this tier five system on my house, does it mean that in four or five years, seven year payback, or whatever, I will have saved yeah. the equivalent amount of money? Yes. Is that, okay. Yeah. Very, very simple 
simple uh, form of calculating your economics rather than going into net present value and all those things. So, so what was that 20 year business that you were talking about before? Oh payback is much faster, four to seven years. No 20 year paybacks in solar PV. Maybe oh. a deep energy retrofit where okay. you're, where you're you. you know, changing your building, okay. and basically building a second building around your Question? Um, I, I guess the goal is this lasts for at least 20 years. That's the warranty on the right. modules, yeah. Yeah. Um, <coughs> do you have a rule of thumb about the condition of the roof that yeah. you're putting these things on? Yes, yeah, presumably. I, yeah. yeah. You, <laughs> the roof's got to have 20 years left in it to. Uh, well, at least 10. You know, yeah, you don't want to. You don't want to put it on a roof that's about to fail. That's for sure. Mm -hmm. um, the one thing about the, the the modules is that they protect the if it's an asphalt roof or a yeah. rubber roof. I think I, I can't say that necessarily for a rubber roof, with the assurity that I can say it for an asphalt roof. But if it, it over asphalt, any kind of asphalt roof, the roof will not degrade under the modules. So if you can design the system to not have any roof left, which the HDC might not love. Um, I don't um, live there. So. Yeah, great. Yeah. No, you want to go right out to the edges as, as much as you can. If you can, you know, if, if the engineering on your house and in the structure, you know, we have to get engineering stamps and everything. So we have to go in and check your attics and, you know, all the framing and all that. And if, if we can give that an okay, that's my favorite system, too. Yeah, it keeps your whole roof preserved. You will, I, you know, I would promise you almost, I would almost bet you that you will never have to replace your roof. Never. <coughs> The, the asphalt is incredibly preserved by the modules. Yeah, that, that comes from you know 30, 30 getting on 30 years yeah. of, of you know having to do a re-roofs yeah. and watching you know looking at you know being on crumbling roofs where the shingles underneath the the arrays are are still perfect. This yeah. question comes up a lot too. It takes us a couple of days to put them up. We can take them down in a couple of days. We can put them in your garage. The roofer can come. We come back and put them up. We've been doing this long enough now that we've got systems out there that have had to come down. The folks have had to re-roof already, and so. How I wouldn't be scared of that, but I, you know, I mean, you definitely want to plan for it. How much do these things weigh? Uh, um, a panel, a panel is about 40, 40, 50 pounds. One each module is about 40, 50 pounds. But, but your cost, I thought you were going to say how much is it going to cost, and that's really, you know, a re-roof, you no, know, so maybe roughly about, about a thousand I'm bucks. I'm worried about lo roof load. Oh, roof loads. It's a two and a half pounds per square foot. Um, it's not okay. that significant in your, uh, you know, everything now for code is uh, 35 pounds per square foot. Mm -hmm. uh, it's know. less than the layer of asphalt shingles you have on your roof now. Well, yeah. I mean, yeah. most of the houses here in Providence yeah. Town are, uh, you know, 18th, 19th century yep. buildings, and they were, you know, and most, mostly posted in beam. Yeah. So they're not like uh, modern construction. It'll no. <laughs> and a part of the process of site visit, we figure these kinds of things out. We're going to determine whether or not your roof needs any extra framing or if it can even be done. Mm. Uh, if it's not traditional framing, conventional, that is two bys, rafters, it's something else, then it's going to get engineered professionally by a professional engineer um, before we get a permit. So. Okay. Yep. And do you not like uh, wooden shingles? Wooden shingles aren't perfect. I mean, the newer the better. Go yeah, the asphalt. Well, sorry, go ahead. Just newer the better. Newer the better, yeah. What, what happens? What I've seen on on the cedar shingles is that the the cedar <coughs> never dries out all the way by because of the shading, and they they will go s somewhat faster than they would without an array on them. So, so it's not it's not good. Did you? Did you yes. Um, what about commercial application, and how does that affect the community in terms of tiering? You you uh you know if you have a commercial application, the community should be all about you know helping you get to t you're going to help get to tier five that much faster, and what that's included. And then I just follow up on that. In terms of the materials that all three uh, vendors are using, are you all using the same materials, same panels? No, um, no, it's, you know, it's a specific to installers. The time of day, uh, literally, that's an exaggeration, but it changes a lot. It's a very fast moving thing. The panels are all third party tested. Um, you know, we wouldn't, you know, there wouldn't be a, a module that would, uh, at this point there isn't a seat there won't be a CEC oversight. So theoretically, we could use a module that wasn't California energy condition, that's another CEC, it's really confusing, that have a list of tested modules that we would always go to, to, to before we would investigate a new module. But you know, as you saw in that co you know, cost drop of modules, that it's been just the most incredibly competitive, tumultuous um, last four years and hundreds of Chinese companies. Typically your modules are made in China. 
Um, you know, they're not like the tools you buy at Harbor Freight Salvage. They have been fine. They've proven to have a good track record. Uh, Sun Powers are, you know, and at this point, all the modules, I think, have a, you know, different, you know, one component is made in one country, then they're assembled in another country, and another component. It's hard to say exactly, you know, what country, all that stuff is getting blurred more and more. But, but in but, terms of efficiency level, are they all relatively efficient? Yeah, do, well, 18% is your, your sort of standard module these days, about an 18% efficiency. Sun Power is roughly 20, a little over 20. Um, there's a, an LG, sorry, that's a, that's a little bit, the LG 300s are around 18. There's, there's a, you know, a Sun Power, an LG 300, which is, you know, a, a higher output, I don't want to stand your module, and you're, and you're going from 16 to 18 to 20. So can I just interject here? I think you're saying if there's three companies and they're all using different materials, I want to make sure that everybody has the same quality so the efficiency is the same. So to answer the question, and I don't want to speak for you, I think that is the fact. There's a certain criteria for all these companies, that's why they're banded together, that they're very you know, using similar type quality, all the materials, the workmanship, everything is going to be very similar. So choosing between one and two, because obviously managing it within these three companies is the best thing. So they're gonna, you know, one comes in and, and it's just distributed. So I think that's a, an important thing to make clear. There's no differentiation between these three companies because they all have that same workmanship and the quality. So unless somebody specific, for a specific reason would like to use a company, they're all three are equal. And I'd like to add that we did have to submit, as part of the program, a list of the components that we would be working with, and they were all approved through Mass CDC. Um, they had a technical consultant look at everything that was submitted. So we are working from the same list of, of components. And just because we're, 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 it's about quarter of eight, we have 15 minutes before the library closes, I think trying to finish whatever Last. vital material Last. that Should we Should I build have, on that too? If you are interested in a site visit, someone eventually is coming out to your house. And so I would not get hung up with every number on that. Someone's going to sit right. down at your table with you and go over them all, so number by reason. number. And so you'll get a better chance to dig into that. Oh. It's a lot to look at Doug. in one night. Doug. Oh, just a minute, Doug. Um, you can see the cash flow. This is, you know, you go even somewhere between year four and five and at year 25. And this is with a, a, a consistent energy cost. This is a fixed energy cost, which I think is probably not going to be the case. So probably this is going to go whoosh, like that. Much, this is cash positive, this is cash negative. Yeah. Really fantastic, amazing, uh, economically attractive uh, thing, as well as the other aspects. Uh, I know that you have to go really fast, but <coughs> we all do so solar shingles, right? No. We are not promoting those, no. Okay. No. Well, yeah, that's a, another How about question. a solar farm? Is there well, P-Town hasn't really got a lot of square footage kicking around. That's what you mean when you know solar farm implies uh, you know a lot of land that you're covering. And we can't buy from other Cape towns that have solar farms. Yes, yes, you 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 might be able to in the coming years. You have uh, talk to Austin. Yeah, talk to Austin. He's gonna he's gonna he's gonna leverage the town of P-Town, the best rate you can get for off of a solar farm. That's his job. Now. Because um, we have a June thirtieth contract deadline and we have to go through, many of us have to go through HTC. We're really backing up into not having a lot of time. We can to write sit down a contract together. contingent on HTC. You don't, you don't have, have to, be to get installed by In fact, we wouldn't yeah. want to go before the HTC until you have a contract. Yeah, but you just but need to sign a contract. Can I get my question the out? 30th. You don't have to yeah. install. My question is yeah. how quickly do you anticipate the, the assessments getting done? June 30th. Oh yeah, we're 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 not gonna slow you down much on that. We'd really prefer that if you jumped. In other words, when you call us and you go through the numbers, we give you a preliminary site evaluation uh, from our desktop. A desktop except Mike won't. He'll probably come right out to your site. Um, um, you're gonna look at those numbers. You're gonna say, yeah, I can live with that, or no, I don't want to do that. You know, we want you to give it a, a good evaluation before you waste your time and our time you know and if those if you what you see on that preliminary evaluation is is acceptable to you we'll be out within a week 
Give us two if okay. we're really busy. So try to I'm try to do it before June. I put well. Okay, this is what I'm getting. At. <laughs> yeah. Put in a piece of paper. Yeah. Can I get my assessment next week? Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. That's what I. You know. That's what I'm looking. Sooner for. Sooner the better. Myself Sooner the better. Yeah. I think many people who are considering this don't realize. How quickly how little, it can, Well, how little time we have yeah. given and what guess, you need to look at. I guess and we only have 10 minutes left before we yeah. get kicked out, too. Right. So it just, but just is an important thing. That's why if everybody signs up, these three companies, that's why we, we, they're banded together. So the volume that we're going to be able to do in the short amount of time that's necessary, that's why we have the ability to do a lot of assessments and installations in a short period, or at least the assessments and then eventually the installations. So as soon as you fill up something else out, you're gonna, we're gonna put all that information down and you're gonna get contact with them within a week. We have a year to install these systems, so right. as long as you sign a contract by the 30th, we could do HTC this fall or the next winter or whatever. You have a year, you have 12 months. But. That example that you did before of the pricing, that was for like the biggest is that correct? No, that's a standard full-size residential. It's <coughs> about, that's about I mean, 400 square feet. Last question uh, for me. <laughs> <laughs> Will this slide, uh, this slide show that you put on, will they be available online yes. to us? Yep. Oh, so we can so. look at all the information yep. at home? Yep, yep, yeah. And we're we'll going to put website. it on the website as well. Yeah. Which website? Yeah. Solarized Mass website. Uh, yep. Solarized Solarized town. Yeah. Yeah. Dot org. Dot org, okay. Yeah. It's on the brochure as well. Okay. So. Um, so I think we'll go ahead and wrap unless you have anything else. So through yeah. lease, anybody here thinking about leases, we said uh, somebody, there was a thought that we were going to get a lot of lease questions. Um, if you can't yes. use the tax credit, the lease is probably something you want to look at. Other than that, we don't particularly like leases. We don't think they give you the best bang for your buck, and they run us through a heck of a lot of What's the, um, junk. the difference in savings? You, um, yeah, oh, gosh, that gets complicated, but you do better financially owning your system, as long as the SREC market holds up, and I think we're pretty sure the SREC market's gonna hold up, and that's one of, one of the bigger challenges that everybody here will face is understanding SRECs and the SREC market. Yeah. I think the CEC did an analysis that buying a system is 10 times more, more beneficial effective. to the homeowner. Right, it's good solar loans, we sort of already covered that, lease, one thing that you really want to look at is uh, when you go to sell your home, if you have leased a system, there may be issues. Let's not talk more about that, but just keep your eyes open for that. Um, most of the Solarized Well Fleet were ownership, not leases. So that's all the, you know, leases are not our favorite option. There are only a few have to do it. Uh, <coughs> SREX, I don't think we really want to go down the rabbit hole too far in SREX. Does anybody understand? Does anybody want to talk about SREX at we, all? We, we touched upon it earlier, and I think. Okay, all right. It's a, it's a market thing that goes up and down. It's not a guarantee. Um, the market prices have been fairly stable. They used to be, woohoo, now they're down there. We can talk about that, but um, we don't really have time. That's one of our favorite installations there. Oh, that's oh, a Pete's house. You guys did that? Yeah. Yay. The flagship. That's the flagship. Um, okay, that's it. Yay. Right. Thank you very much. Jason, just one more thing. For everybody who might be doing like caretaking for folks who aren't here yet, or you know somebody who's coming in a month from now or something, you might just mention this program to them and just include them in. If they're not here and they're probably not yet, they might not know about so the important thing is if just please make sure that you sign up and you can go on the list and people will contact you one of the companies will contact you and do uh, an, uh, an assessment and from there it should be go quickly and any of us are able for questions we're going to be around town we're going to do lo local coffee houses and get a couple people so we're going to have uh, saturday we're going to be at uh, the year rounders and we're going to do events like that and we're going to put it on the website any events that we do all right thank you for all for coming <laughs>